The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV. All content in the Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series has been created for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this television production. Welcome to our Stay Strong, Live Long education series on falls prevention. Brought to you by the VON, the Upper Grand Family Health Team, and by our community partners as well. I want to start by saying that falling is the leading cause of injury-related death among seniors and the number one contributor to loss of independent living. In fact, one in three seniors over the age of 65 will fall each year, and falling just once doubles your chance to fall again. It is our hope that through this Whiteman Telecom production that we can change these statistics in Wellington County by empowering our community with the knowledge and the tools they need to hopefully prevent those future falls. Today's session includes the, the nurturing topic of nutrition and we have with us here Amy Waugh. Amy Waugh is a dietitian with the Upper Grand Family Health Team and thank you Amy for coming. Thanks Julie. Thanks. So we'll spend this session talking a lot about nutrition and uh, particularly as we age our nutritional needs sort of change along with that as well and whether we like it or not we kind of have to kind of keep up with that piece. And a, and a significant um, effect on poor nutrition is your falls risk goes up as well. So it's kind of it's an important piece to this whole picture in addition to everything else that you've been been hearing about for the last few sessions. So as Julie mentioned 30 percent of, of Seniors, uh, which is one in three, are roughly uh, estimated to be malnourished. And we know those who end up in hospital, one in, one in two, 50% are malnourished. And most are dehydrated. So 75% of seniors and probably most adults run around a little on the dehydration, dehydrated side of things. So if you're dehydrated, you're likely to be dizzy, likely to have a higher risk of having a fall as a result of that too. So just drinking your water every day is really a key, never mind worrying about uh, the kinds of foods that we're eating too. So weakened muscles are another big part of this for sure. So if we have not enough uh, nutrition in our bodies every day, our muscles tend to take the brunt of that poor nutrition and they will start to deteriorate a lot more quickly than they would otherwise. So we'll talk a lot about protein today, we'll talk a little bit about calcium. You already would have had uh, a session perhaps on the bone health where we really talked a lot about calcium, vitamin D and protein, but today is kind of a, a global overview of of just good nutrition. All of the food that we eat, you hear about carbohydrates, you may hear about fat, you hear about protein, and those are kind of the three components of food. And every food has a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, a little bit of carbohydrate, depending on what it is. There's no food that's just pure carb, pure protein, pure fat. All foods are kind of a combination of those things. So we tend to think of certain foods as being, oh, that's a carb, that's a protein, this is a fat, but most foods are really a combination of all three of those, those nutrients. Most of the fuel from food that we get is in the form of carbohydrates, and that's kind of the gas in the tank that we need every day to function. Protein we use for muscle um, building, for our hormones, for lots of different things, and fat, again, is a really integral part to being healthy as well. We need fat tissue, protects our organs, connected to hormone function as well. So all those bits and pieces make up uh, um, all the parts of food. So the only time you're ever going to have a pure carb or pure fat is sugar. That's a pure carb. Oils, pure fat. And protein, the only kind of pure form of that would be your protein powders. So really when you think about food, I want you just to kind of think that everything kind of fits and everything's got a little bit of those um, three components in it, but some foods may be a little bit heavier in carbs, some may be a little bit better in the fat department, and others we consider them to be kind of what we call protein foods. Okay. 
With respect to muscles and bones, our focus is really on the protein, the calcium, and the vitamin D. And we did talk about that in a previous session. But just to kind of emphasize that, that the calcium and vitamin D are integral to our bone health. And vitamin D is also helpful at fall prevention by itself. So never mind the calcium. If we don't have enough vitamin D, we're at a higher falls risk as well. Vitamin D does not come in any food except fish. And I don't have any real fish, but... <laughs> Salmon, fatty fish, mackerel, sardines, herring, that's the only food source that we really have where we get any significant amount of vitamin D. Anybody know where we get vitamin D mostly? In the audience? Sun. Sun. sun, right? The sun is where we get vitamin D and given the lifestyles that we live, we're all in hats, we've got sunscreen on, we've got long sleeves on, we don't work outside anymore, our vitamin D intake is, is very low as a result of our, our current lifestyle. So it's very important to supplement with vitamin D. That's probably the only nutrient that I ever, with my clients, would emphasize is worth supplementing because you just don't get it in food. There's a little bit in margarine, there's a little bit in eggs, but other than that, it's really fatty fish is the only place, and you'd have to eat fish about three times a day to get enough vitamin D. So that's something that's worth supplementing, absolutely. Vitamin D helps us absorb the calcium from our gut as well. So calcium and vitamin D really work together at creating strong bones. Kind of one, you can't have one without the other. Calcium is a, is a nutrient that many of us are at risk of not getting enough of. So most adults over the age of 50 do not get enough calcium from their food. It's not hard to get enough, but we often don't just because of the types of foods that we tend to go to as our go-tos. Um, we don't tend to get as much calcium. So the guidelines for calcium are to aim for around 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. And you could get some of that from a supplement as well, um, but probably not more than 500, I would say, is to take as a supplement. The rest of it should try to come from food. And we'll talk about where those foods, um, where you can find calcium from foods in a little bit later. Protein, again, really important for bone health. Protein, when people tend to think of protein often in Canada, we think of Meat, mm -hmm. meat's kind of the go-to. But protein comes in all kinds of forms, and we'll talk a lot more about this in a little while, but it's definitely meat, our chicken, fish, beef, but it's also beans and lentils and peanut butter and nuts and seeds. Those are all, and eggs, great protein sources as well. Most Canadians and most people over the age of 50 actually get enough protein in our diets. The group of people that I would probably be concerned about if you've got friends or family members who are what we call tea and toasters, they are kind of drinking tea and eating toast. Um, those people are definitely at risk of not getting enough protein for sure. And we know that people who are in long-term care facilities are often um, getting insufficient protein. But otherwise, most of us in Canada do tend to get enough protein and, and often sometimes a little bit more than we need. So we'll talk a lot about that too. But that's for muscles and bones, it's protein, calcium, vitamin D. Those are the key things that we're thinking about. We're also thinking about having a healthy heart. So that's, again, a key organ in the body that you really need to be functioning as well as possible. Circulation, it manages our blood pressure, kind of pumps our blood around. That's how we get oxygen to all of our tissues, our brain. So really, really important to keep um, that in mind as well. And I will say that when we're talking about a healthy heart, where we're gonna talk about a healthy brain next too, those two things go together. So what's good for your heart and brain and vice versa, okay? We talk a lot about fats, and there's been, for the last probably 30 years, a real emphasis on fat in the diet, and what's a good fat, and what's a bad fat, and how much should we be low fat, should we be too much fat. So we'll talk a little bit about saturated fat. Saturated fat is what is most linked to heart disease. It comes from mostly animal products. So when we're thinking about saturated fat, it would be meats, it would be also our dairy products, so higher fat dairy, milk, cheese, yogurts, ice cream. That's probably where most of our saturated fat comes from in the Canadian diet. Cheese is a big one, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Most of us only need about 15 to 20 grams of saturated fat a day. And how much do you think would be in this little bit of cheese? Any guesses? Two grams? Two milligrams? Two milligrams? <laughs> <laughs> you're hoping 
there's about six to seven grams of saturated fat in that little tiny one ounce of cheese. So if we only need 15 to 20, we're getting about a third of it in our little bite of cheese. And I say bite because most of us, I'd be surprised if that's the extent of the amount of cheese that we have. We might whack off a whole hunk off the brick, right? So cheese is a big one for saturated fat. When we talk about healthier fats, we're thinking of things like polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. And those are more of the oils, olive oil, canola oil, sunflower corn. Those are all polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats, which are, are connected particularly monounsaturated fats, which is olive oil. Avocados, those are a fat too. Let's go put that down. And I brought these just to show because some people don't really aren't used to using avocados in your day. This one is really overripe, I would say. It's really mushy if you stick your thumb on it. This one is actually a little too unripe. It's harder, so I can't even push my thumb into it. But avocados are an awesome little food, but they're a healthy fat. We don't worry so much about limiting this kind of fat. We're really trying to worry about the fat from meats and cheeses as the place to really focus on limiting. But these are fun to put on salads, chop them up, you peel them, they kind of peel like, a, like an orange, and then inside is a, a nice pale green soft flesh. It should be kind of, you should be able to push it with your thumb, and then you know it's ripe. Fiber, fruits and veggies, really key to heart function and cancer prevention and all kinds of things. So that's, you know, we're thinking about brightly colored things, leafy greens, bright colored peppers, um, fruit, all that stuff, the more the merrier. Most of the fiber that we get in our diet is coming from our fruits and veggies, and it's coming from whole grains, which we're gonna, we'll talk about in a little bit. Most Canadians, though, only get half the amount of fiber that they need. So that's kind of a place to think about, probably a, bit, a focus is, do I get enough fruits and veggies every day, and, and are my grains, the carbs in my diet, things that are more whole grain than refined? Okay, because we do only get about half that amount of fiber. Really key for heart health and cholesterol management too. Iron and water are also key functions for that heart. We need lots of, of iron in our food. Again, it's something, a nutrient that as we age, sometimes you may have been told you're anemic or your iron is low. And that makes it challenging from the, the heart function capacity and your ability to get oxygen to all your organs. So if you're, if you're low iron, your blood's not particularly as healthy, you're not gonna have as much oxygen trans traveling around, and the water is key for just having enough volume of blood in your body to keep you from getting dizzy. Okay, so those are the key things for, for heart health, but as I say, it kinda carries in for brain health too. So everything that's good for your heart is really good for your brain. Focused on the brain, again, goes back to those healthy fats that we already talked about versus the saturated fats, so focus on nuts and seeds and olive oils and using those kinds of things as your fat source are really key. B12 is helpful, again, um, mostly B12 comes from animal products and dairy is fortified with B12. Okay, so we do get most of us B12, but again, as we age or you're on particular medications or you're taking a lot of antacids, like over-the-counter Tums, or you're taking other um, prescription antacids for reflux, your B12 is likely to be low. So again, thinking about, do I have enough protein in my day? Have I got some dairy going on? Or a supplement, if you've had your blood tested and your doctor said, hey, your B12 is low, it's often something that is required uh, to be taken as a supplement. It's just good for nerve function, generally. Carbs, again, it's just fuel for the body. That's our number one fuel source is carbohydrates. That's the gas we require to kind of function in our day. If you don't have much carbs, starchy things, so that in here we're talking about grains, um, pasta, bread, oatmeal, popcorn, potatoes, those are all carbs. That's our number one fuel source. So if you're kind of reducing these things or have taken them out completely, which is kind of a popular in some, <laughs> some circles today, it's not always the best idea because that's your number one fuel source. And if you take it out, you're gonna find after a couple of weeks you're not functioning 100% and that's why. Your brain can only use carbs, which is essentially gets broken into sugar. That's your brain's number one fuel source. So if you don't have a lot of carbs in your diet, you're gonna be starting to struggle a little bit with focus, with concentration, and your ability to function 
during the day. I will say for brain health, if you're someone who is diabetic or pre-diabetic or blood sugars are a bit of an issue, that's a really key piece to make sure your blood sugars stay in check because high sugar really affects our brain and our cognition and, and is connected to uh, earlier dementia. If so, keep your blood sugars under control, but you can do that by still consuming healthy carbs. That's a Okay. So I'm gonna kind of show you, I don't know if people have seen the, the food guide, but this was updated a few years ago in 2011. It's not unlike our old food guide used to be, it's still a rainbow. But you'll notice that the green, it's in arcs of colors, and the size of the arc indicates how much of the proportion of that type of food that you should be eating every day. Okay. So the green one, the fruits and veggies, most important, most of the food we eat should come out of this category. Next, we've got grains and starches, milk, dairy alternatives, which would be also things like soy milks, beverages, the um, nut milks, almond milks, those are kind of in this category as well. And also the animal products, meats and alternatives, beans, lentils, eggs, peanut butter are all in this. Inside, there's a little section that just talks about healthy fat as well, right at the bottom of this middle section. So you can find this food guide at, some doctor's offices have them, public health has them. You can order them online from Health Canada. But it's a good little guideline in terms of how to think about how we eat. So if we just kind of look a little more closely at the inside, and you'll see this on your screen probably. As you read across the top of the food guide inside, it goes by age and gender. So you read across and you'll see that there's children, teens, and adults on the far right hand side. And then you would go to your age. So 51 plus is that two columns on the far right. The numbers inside those boxes are a bit of a guideline as to how many portions of that type of food you should try to be aiming for each day. Okay. And this is for individuals over the age of 51, that, that far outside column. So seven fruits and veggies, six or seven grain products, three dairy or alternatives, and two to three proteins servings. Okay. So this is not a prescription, it's not a diet that you need to follow, but it gives you a little bit of a guideline as to you know, am I kind of under, am I really over in something? It gives you a bit of a something to kind of aim for, just to kind of compare what you're doing to what you might want to be aiming for. When we talk about food, the servings sizes, the food guide does tell you what a food serving looks like. So it'll have a picture, it's got pictures of different food items. It also has the measurements on there, so if you want to look for the measurements. Sometimes it has weights, and sometimes it's got, it's using uh, measuring cups or measuring spoons to show you how much it is, okay? So if we kind of go through, we'll go through each of those groups and kind of point out what exactly a serving sort of looks like. It doesn't mean that that serving is what you're gonna maybe eat at that meal. You might eat two, you might eat three, you might have a half, and that's okay. Okay, it's just a guide. It's not meant to be a prescription and it's not meant to be where you kind of stop. So if you talk about fruits and veggies, vegetables and fruits for the most part are in half cup servings. Okay, so if you kind of are thinking about veggies, each of these is about a serving size. It's about a half a cup or like what would ever fit in the palm of your hand. So if we're aiming for seven servings of fruits and vegetables every day, I try to, people usually aim for half fruit, half veggies. That's just kind of a good way to divvy it up. So that would be the equivalent over the course of your day, you'd wanna have three or four little piles of veggies, about like this, okay? And then you know you're gonna kinda get there. It doesn't matter if they're raw or if they're cooked. There are benefits to eating raw, there's benefits to having some stuff cooked. So kind of, again, a mixture would be a good way to go there. With fruit, Again, it's about a half a cup or a small piece of fruit. So a pear, an apple, an orange. What do people notice about two apples? <laughs> Everything is bigger. Everything is bigger everywhere we go, even at the grocery store. 
So when we're talking about a serving of fruit, this is actually a serving of a fruit, an apple. This would be considered two apples. Okay. And that goes for a lot of oranges. Bananas are quite large now too. So a banana usually, I tell people, count that as a couple servings of fruit. Okay. And this apple, if they're bigger, you know, if they're the size of a tennis ball or bigger, it's probably more like two. Okay, and that's kind of more like one. Leafy green things, again, these are all good things to add. The more color you've got, the better when we're eating. Kale, leafy green things are about a cup a serving. Okay, so you'd want to chop that up and it's a little bit more because they're just light, they're fluffy. You've got to get a little bit more of those things. Okay, but the more colorful, the merrier. And just kind of, again, ballpark over your day. Do a little food journal each, maybe for a day, and just write down everything you do and see how it kind of adds up. So you'll see there's a chart on your a screen, too, that just gives you an indication of fruits and veggies, and, and uh, they're by one cup serving. So again, you'll see that that large banana, that's like a couple pieces of fruit. Okay, but it gives you just a sense of some of those bigger fruits and options. Okay, the more the merrier, the more variety, the better in terms of fruits and vegetables as well. But at the end of the day, it's just getting them in. I often get the question, too, about whether I should buy organic or not, right? And so I'll just kind of speak to that a little bit. All the research that we have around our health, particularly heart health and cancer prevention, is linked to, to regular old produce. It's not based on organic. So the benefits to fruits and vegetables doesn't matter if it's organic or not. Okay? You're going to be healthier eating any kind of fruits and vegetables than none. So to not let that fear of organic stuff sometimes is a lot more expensive, sometimes it's hard to find, but not to worry so much that the health benefits are from vegetables and fruits, period. And if you don't eat them just because I can't afford organic, you're going to be less healthy. Okay, so that's um, what I will say to that. There are some things that, you know, if you can do it and they're cheap and they're on sale and they're organic, absolutely feel free to go for it, but don't feel that if you can't buy organic, then it's not worth eating the other stuff because you're going to get the benefits from those things regardless. So the next we're going to talk about grain products and what constitutes a serving. So that's kind of most of the stuff that's on this little tray. And that could be everything from bread, bagel, okay, popcorns a grain, crackers, barley, had a question about potatoes earlier. So potatoes are not a vegetable. Potatoes are a starch, a carbohydrate. Whether they're a sweet potato or white potato, okay, they're, they're considered starch and carbs. Sweet potatoes are still amazingly healthy, tons of nutrients in them, but they do count as a, as a carb, as a breads and cereal, not so much as the veggies. Okay, so just remember that. This is about a portion. So these, half a bagel, this is mashed potatoes, <laughs> slice of bread, and keep in mind the size of this slice of bread. Again, bread, everything's bigger, so bags of bread, most some of the big rye loaves, each slice might be more like two slices of bread, okay? The bagels at some of our local places we might go are more like three or four, okay? So just keep in mind that um, the portions that we buy when we're out and about of, of starchy breads and cereals are usually supersized. They are not a Canada's Food Guide type of a serving. And because it's commonplace we, and everybody's doing it, we tend to just think it's okay. It becomes the norm when it, that's all we see. And so just keep in mind that um, some of those things that we just kind of grab and go, thinking that counts as one of my breads, it might be three or four of your breads for the day. And that's where sometimes this is probably the category most of us go overboard in consuming is the starches, the carbs. The more of those things that are whole grain, the better. So when I talk of a whole grain, I mean you're eating uh, real oatmeal versus Cheerios, right? There's a difference between Cheerios and oatmeal. There's a difference between your crackers or pasta that have whole grains in them versus just white flour. And you'll be able to see that on labels, so I'm not, and I'm not promoting necessarily any products. But on the label, it will say whole grain. So on this pasta box, for example, it says whole grain flour. That means they've used the whole wheat kernel and crushed it up to make the flour. Versus white pasta, a lot of our cereals, flake cereals, Cheerio cereals, they've crushed up the, f the grain, gotten rid of all the fiber and all the healthy wheat germ out of it, and they've just left the white starch part. And that's what we call a more a refined carb. 
not quite as healthy as using whole grain stuff. Okay, so as much as possible, trying to find things that are higher fiber, whole grain breads, whole grain crackers, using oatmeal for breakfast, barley in soups, so it's kind of winter time coming up. Soups are a great way to add a lot of whole grains. You can use barley, you could put quinoa in them, you could put all kinds of, of neat grains in there. So I just wanted to emphasize again just the whole grains and we do get caught up because most of us it's grab the crackers, grab the muffins, grab the cereal, grab the you know more refined carbs but it is a season where you can start adding grains and things like quinoa is very popular. Quinoa is a, a grain that's really high in protein, lots of iron in it. This is kind of, uh, quinoa comes in all kinds of different colors. This is a red one so I don't know if you can see this. So, but. They're just teeny weeny and they're very much like a, um, they cook fast, 10 minutes they're cooked. You just cook it kind of like rice with a bit of water and, and it comes white too. It just kind of looks like little, um, little tiny sesame seeds, the white one, just like in this bag. That's what that looks like. You can cook it in a little bit of broth if you want flavor, like you're cooking um, a rice with a bit more flavor in it or you can just cook it with plain old water. Things like wheat berries are really good too. Those, again, they cook, they're good for salads. You can throw them into soups. They don't fall apart. They stay kind of chewy. So this is just really a wheat kernel. That's what we're crushing up to make our flour with. But you can just cook them like you would use rice or quinoa or, or any other grain. Barley, same sort of thing. You could put that into soups. Popcorn, good snack, whole grain. Right? Very different than crackers, chips, those kinds of snacks. Still carbs, so there's kind of that mantra of good carbs, bad carbs, that's kind of a true thing, that's a real thing. We would call, you know, the white processed stuff a little bit more of the bad carbs, the good carbs would be things that still look like they you kind of picked them out of mother nature. Okay, so I think we're going to move on to dairy and dairy alternatives. So our fourth little kind of third group going across the, um, the food guide and I'm going to focus in on this little part here. So dairy and alternatives is an important piece in terms of calcium and they're also this group of foods is particularly high in protein for the most part as well. So when we're thinking about where we get our protein from, it's not just from that protein and alternatives group, it also comes a lot from this uh, dairy group. And that could be things like cottage cheese, it can be milk, it could be yogurt, it could be kefir which is a fermented yogurt product, it could be um, the coconut milks, almond milks, soy milks, those things are what we call the milk alternatives. They're not dairy, but they've been fortified to mimic dairy because that's how we tend to consume them in Canada as a replacement for, for a cow's milk uh, product. So they are fortified with calcium, with vitamin D. They're made to mimic the nutrients that we get from, from most dairy products. So that's why they're in that same category. When you think about the portions for dairy products, again, about a cup of milk, same amount of calcium and protein as in this little yogurt cup, okay? Same as in the piece of cheese, these little triangles. Those are all kind of about the same amounts in terms of their calcium and protein content that you're aiming for. Cottage cheese, another great one. You can get that in different fat levels too. About a half a cup of cottage cheese would count. So we're aiming for about three servings a day for most people. And that's in order to get enough calcium. That's why that number is in that three department. So aiming for that, if you can, finding ways to do this. If you're not a big milk drinker, but using it if you're making soup, you could alternate, put milk in instead of water. If you're making oatmeal, you could use milk instead of water if you're trying to kind of boost your, your calcium intake up. Yogurt's a great one, making smoothies, put fruit on top of it. So there's lots of ways to kind of get that. Some people, um, there's lactose in milk products, which is a milk sugar. Some people have more challenges uh, digesting that milk sugar, causes some abdominal pain. You can buy most things lactose free now. Milk, yogurts, cottage cheeses, all those things you can buy lactose free. Or you can get the little uh, drops that you can actually add to those products yourself that are much, much cheaper than doing that too. Okay. The last group we'll talk about is again protein and servings of protein. I don't know if people can kind of see the size. This is a pork chop size of this. This is a fairly typical sometimes serving of meat. And I will ask you guys around here, how many servings do you think that is? Two. two. Yep, that's two, right? It's two. 
We only need three a day, right, of our protein. Most of us, if you, this is the size, this is a serving of a chicken breast. Okay. Most chicken breasts, though, that we buy today in the grocery store are about twice that size, and some of them are even three times that size. So again, it's a bit of that myth of it looks like the portion, so this is a portion. But just keep in mind that sometimes you might be getting all three of your servings of protein in one meal, depending on the size. So a good kind of rule of thumb about how to, to know if it's enough protein is if it's about the size of a deck of cards or about the size of the palm of your hand, minus your fingers, or a computer mouse is another good, good benchmark to know that that's about a serving. And when we get protein, again, we're thinking about fish. That would be a serving of a piece of fish, two and a half ounces, okay. About half a can of salmon would be about the same, okay. Or tuna, same idea. But this is also the group that you want to remember. It's beans, it's lentils, it's peanut butter, it's eggs, it's nuts, it's seeds. Those things are all good sources of protein as well and contain a tremendous amount of fiber. So those are things, and again, we don't consume nearly enough of these types of foods in Canada, but they're extremely beneficial to our health because they're high fiber, they're low saturated fat, they really fill you up too. So again, those kinds of things, there's all kinds of beans and lentils, right? There's little white beans, there's these little orange lentils you can throw into soup. These cook in about five minutes and they kind of explode and go kind of mushy, is what would be my word. Um, but they're great if you want to thicken up a soup or something like that, okay? The brown ones, which I'm not sure I have, I don't have will stay together. So the brown lentils, you can buy them dried, you can buy them in a can, just rinse them and they stay whole. And those are great things to throw into soups, throw on top of a salad, okay? You can cook them in broth as well for a bit of flavor. I would say if you're getting canned, just rinse them because they're often uh, a lot of salt in the canned ones, but you can rinse those off. A lot of the salt washes away, okay? So those are great things to think about too. About a half a cup of beans would count same as, as your piece of meat. So two or three per portions a day of protein and try to think about maybe meat being one of them and the other two should come from some of those other foods, whether it's eggs, nuts, lentils, beans, would be a, a better balance there. We tend to overdo, overdo our, our meat sometimes in Canada. Okay, oils and fats, we talked a little bit about the types of oils and fats earlier. We do need some in our diet, two to three tablespoons though max a day. And that includes butter or margarine that you might put on your toast, it will include salad dressings, it would include if you're using a bit of oil to cook something in. So it sneaks in lots of places. We usually don't have to think about intentionally adding more oil to our, our diets. Um, but you may be hearing a lot, um, some people are using coconut oil a lot and putting it on everything. You, you don't need to be usually emphasizing adding oil to stuff as much as you, um, because it does sneak into all kinds of places. So two to three tablespoons max of those kinds of oils because we're also getting fat from all the other stuff we're eating too. Okay, our nuts, seeds, dairy, meats, proteins, those foods also all have fat in them. So just a little bit of extra if you need it and the more you can choose the unsaturated fats and oils, the better, and less of those saturated fats. But a little bit of saturated fat is okay. So just to, ref to review the labels that you will see on, on a lot of products to help you maybe make some decisions and what you might be looking for, all the labels in Canada now have look the same. So you'll see across the top, it'll say the nutrition facts and right underneath that nutrition facts, the first thing you see is actually the serving size of what they're speaking about on that label. So you just have to kind of keep in mind if that three quarter cups of a yogurt, is that actually how much I'm eating or am I gonna have twice that or am I maybe only having half that amount? Because all the numbers on that label refer to three quarters of a cup of that product. They all have to tell you the calories that are in that amount and the fat, sodium, carbs, and protein. And at the very bottom, you'll see four nutrients that are always listed and it's always the same four because those are nutrients that we tend to not get quite enough of in the typical Canadian diet, which is vitamin A, calcium, vitamin C, and iron. 
the percentages that you see are indicative of the amount of that um, nutrient that you're getting in that serving of food. So if you see the 4% beside fat, the 4% means that you're getting 4% of your total fat needs for the day from a half a cup of that yogurt. That's what the percents mean. It does not mean that they're 4% fat in the product. Okay? It means you're getting 4% of what you need. You might be looking for things like how much sodium is in a product. You might be watching your sugar and fiber. All that information is on there. Okay? And a label by itself is sometimes useful if you're looking for a particular um, nutrient and you just want to know is this high, low, or otherwise. But the best way to kind of use labels for, from my perspective is that if you're trying to make a choice, you want to decide should I buy this yogurt or should I buy that yogurt? Should I buy this cereal or that cereal? They're good to kind of compare. But just make sure that you're comparing the same portion sizes together because not, the labels are not consistent, um, which is really unfortunate that they're not consistent. So just keep that in mind. Just make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So the question um, th is about yogurts and, and how much fat's in the yogurt and all the different products. And there's Greek yogurt and there's 0% fat and there's 19% fat. And, and what do I pick? Right? How do we know? Um, and again, I'm not promoting one or the other. The Greek yogurts are, they've been drained of a bit of fluid. So they're thicker, and that's why they're, Greek yogurt is kind of the name that we've given to that uh, particular style of yogurt, but it's thicker. It tends to be higher in protein and higher in calcium because a lot of the water has been drained off, so everything has become concentrated. Okay. With respect to the fat, you'll see everything from zero to sometimes high percentages of milk fat in yogurts uh, in particular. I would say that the emphasis on the fat, if you've got um, high cholesterol, you're really managing heart disease risk, you may want to choose something a little lower in fat. However, um, there's a lot of debate right now in the nutrition world about is the saturated fat in, in milk products actually the same as saturated fat in meat products. And they're actually not the same. There's a lot of different kinds of saturated fat. Saturated fat is not just one thing. It's a whole bunch of different types of fats. And there is some thinking that the dairy fats are maybe not quite as harmful in the same way with respect to heart disease as the fats in the animal products, the, the meat products. So. I'm personally not a fan of telling my clients that you need to go find low fat 0%. I, I don't think that's necessary. Um, fat provides us with some satiety. It helps us feel satisfied. And if you're choosing everything low fat, zero fat, you're going to feel hungrier than if you just had a little bit of something that might have actually had some healthy fat in it. So there's nothing wrong with little bit of fat in our, in our diet. I think if you were you know, consuming this much of a 19% fat yogurt every day, you're going you're gonna to probably be exceeding your saturated fat intake for the day. But I don't think you have to choose 0% low fat everything. Okay. And that's kind of shifting right now in the, in the literature. So I think that's it for label reading. Just I would again emphasize people don't get so lost in the labels. Of, of really, um, you know, you're kind of looking for things that have lots of fiber, less sugar, lower in saturated fat. And trans fat in particular, which you'll notice on that label, is a particularly bad type of fat. So it's the fat that's in um, shortening, it's in commercially prepared bakery products, it's in um, some of the microwave popcorn butter flavor, you find it in there. A lot of processed cookies and crackers, you may see some trans fats. Those fats are particularly damaging to the body because they not only raise our cholesterol, um, the bad cholesterol, they actually lower your good cholesterol. So we have LDL cholesterol and we've got HDL cholesterol. The HDL is our healthy one and saturated fat from cheeses and meats does not seem to affect our good cholesterol but trans fats do and they, they lower it. So they're particularly bad and we are starting to have them weaned out of the food supply um, but they're still there. So just trying to keep your eyes open for the trans fats but they always have to be on the label. So we've talked a lot about um, just the types of food and that balance piece. And I'm not a fan, you don't need to start measuring everything under the sun either. And, and I wouldn't suggest that you need to start counting calories. 
But just again, when you're looking at, at your day to day and your plate, if your plate sort of looks like this, half vegetables, little bit of starch, little bit of protein, you're going to be eating a fairly balanced diet without sitting there and, and, and counting all the, um, the details of that diet. But thinking about your plate looking like this as much as possible, you know you're going to be on the right track. If you're thinking about, you know, you don't really want to measure either, there's a quick little thing with our hand that we can kind of use to measure. Basically, a tablespoon for most of us is the size of the end of our thumb. And uh, you've got this up on, your, on the screen probably. A teaspoon is the tip of your finger. If you're thinking about ounces of meat, about two ounces is about, the, sorry, one ounce is the size of a couple of fingers for most women in the room, okay? Guys, you might have, one finger might be enough. Two fingers generally though is about an ounce. So when you're kind of aiming for two to, you know, to three ounces of meat, it's kind of the size of the end of your, your fingers or the part of the palm of your hand. That's about three ounces. And when we're talking about you know, things like particularly potatoes or starchy things, half a cup, just my fingers, half a cup, my whole fist from the wrist up is about one cup, which would be a, a couple of servings. Okay, so that's another way just to ballpark your food if you're kind of looking at it on your plate. Tennis ball, one cup. Golf ball, a little bigger, is closer to half a cup. I think it's also really important, um, and what I really work with my clients around too, is that food should be enjoyable. This is not about um, always the, the micro details of how much calcium and how much protein uh, and what kind of nutrients I'm getting. But if your plate's kind of balanced, you're eating probably fairly well, part of eating is the enjoyment that we get from eating. And so I love this image because it, it gives you just a pause to sort of just observe your food, enjoy it. How we eat is really important too. So eating with people, eating without the television on, sitting at a table, not in the car, in front of your computer, checking your email, right? How we eat is very fundamental to our health and well-being and we know that too. So people who live the longest, when you look around the world, are people who eat together en masse as a family. There's some community around food and that's really, really important. And just to be aware that, am I enjoying this? Does it taste good? Because if it doesn't taste good and you're not having a, a pleasurable time, food becomes very, it becomes burdensome and not quite as much, much fun. So I hope that this has been helpful and informative and everybody's got a sense of kind of what's healthy eatings look like and in terms of uh, false prevention just making sure you're adequately nourished is, is, is extremely important um, and hydration drinking water 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 as much as possible so thank you I don't know if we'll have time but I do have some questions yep sure let's see what you fit in okay um, often um, I you know that hydration is a huge issue with seniors and there always comes the question of whether or not, you know, coffee or tea that are diuretics can be included as, um, you know, one of their hydration drinks. And I know there's lots of studies that go back and forth, whether they can be or whether they can't be. So what's your take mm -hmm. on that? So the question is whether or not from a fluid perspective, a coffee and tea would count as, as fluid intake. And I would argue that it does count as fluid intake. So yes, caffeine does uh, sometimes have a bit of a diuretic effect in that it makes us have to go to the washroom and you might pee out more of that fluid. But those kinds of things count as fluid. Um, you'd have to drink, a, you know, we, most people need about a liter to a liter and a half of fluid. We also have to keep in mind that all of our fruits and veggies are fluid too. So sometimes people, I think, artificially think I need to drink way more fluid than they might need because you forget that we get about half our fluid it actually comes from the food that we're eating. So I wouldn't be counting tea and coffee as part of your, you know, your four to six cups of, again, in a cup being about this big, right? So you would be counting them. Yeah, yeah. As, as fluid, for sure. Yeah. Yep, yep. Good. Good. I noticed, um, Amy, on your plate that the dairy was not Mm. Was that because we anticipated a glass of milk at the table? Is that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in the image, there is a milk to the side, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Great. Absolutely.
to the question, um, is about um, properly cooking lentils. Now, I've heard that if you don't properly cook them, then it's hard to absorb the nutrients from them. So do you have any, is that true? Or if so, is there any recommendations around that? It is true, um, and particularly with kidney beans, some of the, it's mostly kidney beans too. If you don't cook them, it, you may have a stomach ache. So there's a bit of a, um, a product in most beans and lentils that is really tough to digest and can cause some stomach issues if they're not fully cooked. So you just want to cook them. They take a long time. And that's why sometimes the canned stuff is, is handy and convenient, right? Because they're already cooked, they're very soft. You just have to, every bean's a little different, but the most of them will take about an hour and a half, probably, if you're cooking them from dry beans, an hour and a half to two hours to really cook them. Pressure cookers are kind of back, and that's a great way to cook beans. You can cook beans now in like 15 minutes in a pressure cooker, mm -hmm. and they're totally cooked very, very quickly. But absolutely, you don't want to eat undercooked uh, beans because they, they can give you some grief. Is, is brown bread the same as whole grain bread? <laughs> Not necessarily. So the question is, is brown bread the same as whole grain? It used to be. Um, you need to see whole grain on the label, not whole wheat. Okay, so whole wheat usually means that they've got the fiber and they've got the white starchy part of the seed. So a seed has got the fiber on the outside. It's got then the bulk of the seed is mostly white starch. And right in the middle of the seeds are, is the germ. The germ has most of the nutrition. All the minerals and vitamins tend to be in the germ, and all the fibers in the outside. But the germ goes, it's got the healthy living part of the food in it. It goes bad fairly quickly, so it's advantageous for food industry to remove the germ because the shelf life of their products will be much longer. So whole wheat means usually they've got the fiber in there, but not the germ. Whole grain means they've used the whole grain. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My other question is, is that um, it has been recommended for protein that you get um, the amount that you weigh in kilograms, that amount of grams of protein. Um, but if we talk to, and you don't have to have this aired or not, um, but if you talk to the, the food guide, it's saying that you're always supposed to have three, so that every single person is supposed to have the same amount of protein. So. What, what, what are your suggestions around that and, and whether this is on Rafi or just for my presentation to know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell, well, it comes up a lot more when I do that piece with yes, the next yes, piece yes, too. Yes, yes. So for protein, and uh, so again, the, can't, the food guide is very general. It's not prescriptive and it's hard to be that individual. Um, so yeah, about a, a gram a kilo or I would say half a gram a pound. So if you're 100 and 60 pounds, you need about 80 grams of protein. The food, the protein servings on the food guide each provide about 20 grams. Okay, so you're getting about 20 grams of protein roughly in those Canada Food Guide servings, whether it's you know this meat, this bit of chicken, or it's a half a cup of beans and lentils, a couple of eggs. So you're gonna get your 60 there, but you're getting protein in everything, right? So there's a lot of protein in dairy, there's a lot of protein in our carbs too. And vegetables, while they don't have many calories, all the calories comes from protein. So um, most of us get our protein met regardless. It's very rare. But the last um, Canadian nutrient intake data showed that 99% of everybody over the age of seven, from 50 to above 70, is actually getting their protein. So it's, okay. so it's not as much of an issue. It is an issue if you've got... Um, you or your friend or your neighbors are those tea and toasters, the people who really aren't eating much of anything or are institutionalized, they're likely not getting that protein. Or dentures, right? So again, oral health is really a key to that piece too, um, where those kinds of, those people will be at risk. So it's a good guideline for sure, but it is a guideline, absolutely. It's not prescriptive enough to be that specific. And so a woman who's maybe only 100 pounds She'll probably only need two, two servings, right? And how about um, in a previous module, Amy, someone mentioned a Mediterranean-style diet. Are mm -hmm. you able to speak to that, even in some small measure? Yep. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So the question is just kind of what a Mediterranean diet looks like and how does that compare to what we've been chatting about today. The Mediterranean diet is very much in line with everything we were talking about. The slight difference between Mediterranean diet and how our Canada's food guide is set up is that um, meat is very much minimized on a Mediterranean diet. The protein in a Mediterranean diet is largely fish, beans, lentils. Okay, that's where the emphasis on protein is. And, but otherwise, it's whole grain, tons of veggies, olive oil is the, is the fat of choice on a Mediterranean diet, uh, and very much uh, minimized of simple sugar. So again, it jives with everything uh, for the most part in Canada that we're advocating, except that it's very, very high in fish, beans, and lentils relative to how our food guide is developed here but it's essentially the same thing. And one last question on my end, and you might not have the answer to this and that is okay, but knowing that, that communal eating, or at least eating with people, mm -hmm. um, do you know of resources in Centre Wellington in our community where there is social eating opportunities, especially for our older adults? It's a good question. So the question is, yeah, if you're, you kind of are alone and, and seeking some community around uh, being able to eat together as a group, are there any formal things going on in Centre Wellington? There is a group of women who get together once a month, the Women Who Lunch, actually I think it's once a week okay. um, program. Um, and they were going to start a men's version of that as well, but I'm not so sure it got funded. Um, I know the Senior Centre does a Wednesday lunch. Okay. And that's, and that's every every Wednesday at lunchtime. Okay. That's the only one I've been aware of. Yeah, there is a women who lunch group. I can get you the details or somehow we could put it on the end. She's up in the north. Yeah, she does those in Arthur. So if you're in Arthur, you can go once a month to that. That's right. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so that's So, yep. The so senior center for seniors how do you say that? Center, senior Center for Excellence. Senior Center for Excellence does do monthly lunches too in Arthur. They take place um, at the church that's right on the corner across from Sussman's. That's where that takes place. The Women Who Lunch takes place at the church that's just across the back parking lot from Groves Hospital in Fergus. Um, and I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to confirm a date because I can't remember what day of the week it is, but that's again, it's once a week over lunch, free of charge. It's a volunteer run program. Okay. And over is the light on Main Street from Grace United on Wednesdays too. Same idea. Come out and have Where's that? Grace United Church in Hanover. In, in Hanover. Hanover. Okay. okay. Grace United right. Church in Hanover. Okay. Has a weekly we Friday, uh, every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Is it lunch or supper? Lunch. Lunch. Okay. okay. Every Wednesday a lunch no at Grace United Church, no charge in Hanover. Okay. So there are some opportunities that might be worth, um, yeah, for people to seek out those those Excellent. places to go. Thanks, Amy. Okay. okay. Yep. Well, one more question. Oh, okay. be on the air. But um, how bad are sugar alcohols, and is there any um, sugar alcohols that are worse than other ones? So there's a question around sugar alcohols and whether or not they're good, bad, or otherwise, are there differences in those sugar alcohols? Um, there are, so sugar alcohols are used to sweeten products um, and make them a little bit less uh, sugar heavy. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to see if I've got anything that's got a sugar alcohol in it. Probably not. So the, there's a question around sugar alcohols and whether they're okay. Are there differences in those different, um, so sorbitol, xylitol, any of those words that end in O-L, that's kind of your clue on an ingredient list that that's a sugar alcohol. We don't absorb them out of our gut. So they taste sweet. We don't absorb them as sugar, so they don't affect blood sugar. And it's how they make some products lower calorie because they don't have to put sugar in. They put the sugar alcohol in. One of the side effects can be, though, if you do a lot of them, is loose stools because you're not absorbing them, so fluid gets pulled into your gut, and that's kind of a side effect. So if you overdo the diabetic candies or cookies, that can be one of the side effects. In terms of differences between them, there's really no difference between the two of them, and in terms of safety, they're all kind of equal equivalent. 
and there haven't been any safety issues associated with, with the sugar alcohols. It's more the GI side effects that come from overdoing them. Thank you very much, Amy, for that amazing presentation. I hope you guys at home found that information valuable and informative. If you're having any problems obtaining those right amount of nutrients in your diet, just talk to your family physician and they will be able to direct you to the right services. Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we do. And it takes an entire community to prevent a fall. Thank you. For more information about the free, smart, gentle exercise programs in your area, check out the Vaughn Smart website at www.vonsmartexercise.com or contact Smart Program Coordinator Kelly G by phone 519-323-2330 extension 4954 or by email at kelly.gee at von.ca.
The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.